Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest this week is Ellen Gallagher. She is the Chief Financial Officer of Wilkes University in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Ellen is also an accomplished pianist who previously ran operations for a number of arts and cultural organizations ranging from the Pennsylvania Ballet to the Lincoln Center Redevelopment Corp and the American Museum of Natural History in New York, among many others. She's also a first generation student at King's College with master's degrees also from Notre Dame and Villanova. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. Tell us your fun fact. What's something little known about Ellen? Well, I don't think many people know that while I was in New York, I actually took a stranger up on an opportunity to exchange apartments. And she moved into my apartment in New York City for a year. And I moved into her apartment in Monte Carlo for a year. And oh my goodness. it was delightful. I took a much needed break from work. And I uh, will always remember that experience, uh, but very few people know that. What fun. That's, uh, what, there, there was a movie about that, some, or maybe not your life, but about ho house swapping or something along those lines. I'm trying to remember who was in it. It was like Jack Black and, oh my goodness, I can't even think of their names anymore, but great movie. And it sounds like it was a lot of fun. What was the best takeaway from that experience? Just the amazing people that I met and the extraordinary diversity of people that you can imagine visit Monte Carlo in a year. But I joined different clubs and, and went to different places where I knew that strangers and people would congregate. And so I had a great time. This is before social media, before uh, you could meet people from all over the world without being in person. And uh, so I really appreciated that opportunity. That's amazing. What fun. What a great experience. When I got to ask, why Monte Carlo? Well, you know, it was just the magic of it. I mean, who doesn't want to go to Monaco and, and Monte Carlo and you know, that met this woman and, you know, she said, I'd really love to live in New York for a year. And I'm thinking, geez, I'd really love your life, you know, so uh, that's how it how it went on. But it's a beautiful, a beautiful part of the world. And of course, to go up and down the the coast there and do day trips and explore the French Riviera is just heaven on earth. Yeah, twist my arm, hand me a plane and a place to stay <laughs> for a year and see if I don't you know, beat the pilot on board uh, to, to get onto the plane that is. So, oh my gosh, what fun. Well, from there, let's get back to where we are with the university. Now, tell us a little bit about Wilkes University. What's your 30 second elevator pitch? Well, I'm the chief operating officer at Wilkes University, which is a private college in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. We have overall about 5,200 students spread across graduate and undergraduate. And similar to the organization that I graduated from, the university I graduated was King's College. It caters to uh, first generation students. We try to make the college experience accessible and uh, available for students who might be the first in their family to, to go to school. And that's more than just making it uh, affordable. It's also giving them an on-ramp that helps them succeed. And you know, case in point, one of our new initiatives that we're brand new introducing just this year is a program where we provide all of your textbooks for the students. And so we found through in research that many students delay or avoid purchasing their textbooks for various reasons. And you can imagine what that does to their likelihood for success. So that's just one way we're trying to tip the scales in our students' favor. Isn't it funny the little things, you know, you think, well, students maybe got financial aid to help with the tuition or even room and board or a partial scholarship or something. But to the extent that that money is all going to go to the big expenses like that, smaller things and let's face it, textbooks are not a small expense nowadays either. I can, my son is in college right now and I certainly remember what they cost when I was, but uh, if you can't afford the textbooks, that's not a small setback at that point. That's that's way too much content. So they're already not starting out on the road to success. Getting in was the first hurdle, but far from the last to say the least. So that, that's great to have identified those kinds of things. Uh, what's something that you've wish more people understood about your role, about the university, about the industry overall? 
Well, I think there's a great misconception right now and a lot of questioning about the value proposition of a four-year degree mm. uh, from a private university or even the public universities. You know, there it's in the news constantly, the topic of student debt, uh, the topics of the rising cost of higher education and why that is. And in a tight job market where students could perhaps have other opportunities or other options just with the skills they've already acquired, they're wondering if it's worth that investment. And, you know, I, I, I think that for those of us who've built a career after a bachelor's degree and perhaps, uh, you know, a, a graduate degree or two, uh, I think to us, it makes total sense what the value proposition of a, a four-year degree is, but it it takes some convincing, I think, at, at, at this point. And those critical skills, those interpersonal skills, uh, the ability to manage stress and deadlines, I mean, people don't think of those things necessarily as part of the college uh, learning experience, but in fact, they are a part of the college living experience. Absolutely. I remember in undergrad thinking to myself, I think I learned more freshman year from the experience of having a roommate in the dorms who was, let's just say, very different from me than I did from any class that I took that entire year. I had some great classes, but I definitely learned more about life from that roommate situation. That's true. And in addition to the academics, I like to say that you learn a lot about yourself yes. in college as well. So to your point about your interactions with the roommate, but even think of all the people who change majors and, you know, change their their career paths or or their uh, their own trajectory. I think that's, you know, part of, of the experience. You go in and, and think you want to be one thing, but uh, the, the world opens itself in front of you and you look to become something else. Or multiple things, I mean. No, absolutely. And, and who knows where that degree will lead to other things that may or may not. I mean, I certainly didn't go to college for executive coaching. <laughs> that wasn't, I don't believe that was on the list of majors. And I, who who would have thunk that years later that <laughs> this is where we would be. Um, but that, what's your role in changing that understanding? Well, certainly, you know, having conversations like this, uh, but I also try to make myself available to uh, the parents and families as they are trying to navigate the onboarding process or the investigation process in, in college selection. Uh, I think it's it's also important to uh, participate in social media and show that that value, show the the activities, show the awards that uh, our students are achieving, uh, show the different types of career paths that our students then uh, find themselves in. So I try to just make the the reality of college life as present as possible in whatever channels are open. And I want to acknowledge the, the very first piece of that answer which was about being here and not just because I'm thrilled that you're here and I think everybody else is too, but that it it's recognizing that we all, especially in this world of social media, have so many leaders are recognizing that it's not just about leading within the four walls of an institution, academic or otherwise, but it's about becoming known as a thought leader and having an audience that goes beyond your immediate vertical or your silo or your department, whatever it happens to be. So I'm so glad that you accepted the invitation, that you joined me here today and that you're talking with all of us to, to show exactly how that works. It doesn't matter if you're not the comms department. It doesn't matter if you're not the the dean or whatever it happens to be, you can be in finance, you can be in IT and still take on the responsibility of representing the organization and the value that the organization uh, pr pr provides to your people in order to get the word out that much more. We It does take a village and it all is, we all have that responsibility. So, you know, kudos to you for saying, I'm, I'm going to get on this microphone and tell everybody out there why this is important, even though it's may or not technically be quote unquote in your job description, but it is, isn't it? It's, it's in the heart. Well, thank you for inviting me. That gave me the first opportunity. Well, we're glad to have it. And I have a feeling after this one, it won't be your last. So <laughs> now, did you ever think that you had done a great job of explaining something only to have the people look at you like a deer in the headlights? Oh, absolutely, Laura. Well, and, you know, as you uh, mentioned in the introduction, I've worked in a lot of different arts organizations, different nonprofit 
uh, development corporations and worked with museum scientists, faculty members, dancers, singers, choreographers, and I have always had that financial role. So invariably, I'm speaking to the financial situation of whatever organization it is. And I often made the mistake early in my career of, of going as, as highly technical as I possibly could. I was young. I was thinking, you know, I have to show them I really know my stuff. And so I would speak in the most complex financial terms I could, thinking that would inspire their confidence. And instead, I lost them completely. So they'd look back at me and say, okay, now what does that mean? Do we have money or we don't have money? <laughs> But this so, is amazing. You gave all this technical detail. You showed all of your genius. And in the end, they said, I kind of need a yes or no yeah. answer. You know, could you like get that whole thing down to one word? Yes, yeah. no, we'll go from there. Do I have a job or do I have to worry? Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, and, and I, I do try in one-on-one -on -one situations to, you know, really match my audience uh, or my counterpart in a conversation. So if they're a really fast talker and they've got a really, you know, upbeat way of going about it, then I try to match that. And I try to keep up with them. And I think that that resonates with them, but if they're a little more laid back and they really need to kind of process and and they're more sort of thoughtful in every word choice i try to slow down and not kind of be a fire hose and overwhelm them and so that works one on one but in of course in a in a larger audience um you can't you can't necessarily have that individual attention so i have learned to try to use vocabulary and and put my message into a context that opera singers or scientists or uh, different a broad variety of faculty members or others would would resonate with and, and where it would land. So it is something that came over time, but I can just advise, you know, put yourself in their place. What do you think they are thinking about? Is it their job? Is it their departmental budget? Is it the future of the organization? What are they really dying to hear? And then try to to craft your message around that. And so it, you don't lose them. And I think that, you know, that will help the audience retain it. Yes. Yes. And it's in, there are a whole bunch of things that you mentioned in there that I think were really important. One, of course, is the, uh, the nervous reflex of defaulting to almost snowing the audience with details uh, for the purposes of trying to prove your own knowledge, expertise, intelligence, work effort, the, the kind of cover your tail to make sure that you've, you've proven yourself to them when what would actually have been easier is to keep the answer simple, that we get stuck in that expert's curse of, of overdoing it. And for so many of us, that is really a sign of our own um, lack of confidence, ironically, as opposed to because we are so confident in our content. Um, and I'm curious also, because I heard you mention that things like mirroring or matching the other person's speed or energy level to be able to connect to them. What would you say to somebody who says, well, but is that authentic? Is that you trying to be you or is that you trying to be them? Or is that for somebody who feels like, well, why should I have to do that? Then I'm not being myself. Well, I think it is authentic because frankly, I am both of those people myself. I am often in a you know fit of uh, enthusiasm, a super fast talker. I can't wait to get it out and, and I can't. And then sometimes I have to be more thoughtful and pensive and, or I, I just need to be, or I feel that way. So I can tap into both those sides and still maintain my authenticity, but meet someone, you know, where they are as well. I think, you know, I think that's why we all have friends of different, um, energy levels and different types. I know I don't have a group of friends that are all just cookie cutters of each other. Some people are are high energy and some people less so. And, and so I think that we all see in each other uh, what we also connect to as, as individuals ourselves. Absolutely. That's what I like to refer to as your prismatic voice, that you've got the whole spectrum of colors inside of you, just like the rainbow and the white light 
It has all those colors inside. We have our high energy. We have our low energy. We have our easygoing. We have our intense and passionate. Just, okay, What which part of that will this person resonate with best? And then just tap into that. It's all in there already. Just kind of forget sometimes. Well, you know, I think, Ellen, this would be a great time to... Um, do our listener 24 hour influence challenge, our challenge of the day. How would you like to challenge our audience to take one step that they can complete within 24 hours to have more influence? Well, Laura, I would challenge the audience to think back uh, if they have graduated from a, a college or a university and think about what it did for them and, and maybe a certain faculty member or advisor uh, who really had an impact on their development and their trajectory. And in the next 24 hours, if you have the ability, look them up on LinkedIn or just go to the university's website and just do a, a search. Uh, if they're still on the faculty, they'll pop right up and shoot them a little email. Believe it or not, faculty are so invested in each one of their students, they're going to remember you. It's uh, it, it, it's not the, uh, the the long parade that you think it is. They take a great interest and have a, a, a good memory of each student. So I would challenge, reach out, say thank you, say how they have helped you, and it's going to make someone's day. I couldn't agree more. And you know what? I would say even if they if you didn't happen to go to a traditional university, did you go to a you know a trade school of some sort? Did you apprentice with somebody? Did you whatever whoever was a teacher? to you in some capacity or another, find them and thank them. So just because you didn't go to a four-year institution of some sort, you're not off the hook. I'm not letting you off the hook. You got to take up the challenge anyway. Okay. Then what about a time when, what was the most nervous that you ever felt before a presentation or a speaking engagement? And what lesson oh. did you learn? Well, definitely. Uh, there was a time I was chairman of the board of a software company called Tessitura Network, and uh, their annual users conference is attended by you know thousands of, of users. And I presented the keynote uh, panel uh, one year in front of the entire uh, conference attendees, and it was in the round. And so even though I was you know, familiar with so many of the organizations that were present, uh, just having that audience you know, encircle you, they're on all sides and leading that panel, I was, I was terribly nervous. It shocked me actually how nervous I was because I've done this quite a bit. Uh, but those differences uh, made me uh, a little more on edge and how I handled it, um, really uh, it was a, uh, a, a series of of informal and and mundane conversations. I hung out with the crew, the guys that were behind the curtains and doing the sound and video. I chit chatted with some of the folks doing the food service and who were making sure their with catering table was fine. And you know, just it turned it into any other day, just by having those those conversations. It was a job to them, and I thought, you know, it's it's just my job to go out there and moderate this panel. And how, so have you been able to extrapolate that into future, or were you able, I should say, to extrapolate that into future speaking engagements to moderate, to, to mitigate those nerves? Oh, absolutely. And I think that it, it has to be remembered when I'm speaking, I have to remind myself even that the people in the audience want you to succeed. They want it to go well too. They're sort of interested and I rely on that knowledge when I'm going out there and thinking, we're all in this together. Yeah, I think that's such an important key that we're in this together. People tend to forget that. Um, now, what about a time when you needed to inspire others? Uh, so early in my career, I worked with a choreographer and uh, the two of us were uh, invited to come manage uh, Pennsylvania Ballet in Philadelphia. So uh, my colleague as the artistic director and I was the general manager. Uh, but shortly after we arrived there, uh, we found from the board of directors that the company was in dire financial straits and they wanted to suspend operations and, and close the company down. So, of course, we're brand new in town and we happen to be all ready with a, a 10 day run of a series of, of shows. And so we came up with an idea um, sort of generically titled Save the Ballet. <laughs> okay. But we uh, we thought, you know, if we could just raise enough money over these 10 days, 
uh, we could perhaps uh, change the, the course of, of the future here and keep this company open. However, we didn't have any authority to spend any money. So inspiring others came into play because we had to convince the various groups that come together to make a show uh, to do it for no pay. Uh, we couldn't pay anybody. And, and so- who, were now, who, who included was included in the, these various so the, groups? The three groups uh, were the dancers, of course, dancers mm -hmm. on stage, the orchestra uh, who were accompanying the, uh, the, the dancers, the, the musicians in the pit, and then, of course, the, the tech people. So the stage hands, the, the stage manager, all of the tech people that manage the uh, production on set. So all now, three. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. All no, three I, are unionized. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. Okay. So it's not just performers and musicians and the tech people unto themselves. They are union tech, union performers, union musicians. Ah, so that adds a little more complexity to the situation. Tell me about that. Well, we wanted to give people an opportunity to decide individually. So in, in, instead of putting it on the entire group at one time, you know, we did speak to them individually because to your point, there were individual and distinct union structures to these things. So we spoke to the dancers, and this is to your point of in, uh, inspiring others, it was three separate meetings. So spoke to the dancers, spoke to the musicians, spoke to the tech teams, and individually talk to them about the situation we were in and what we were hoping to accomplish and let them all sort of go off and speak with their individual uh, representation and see if they would agree to, to do this 10 day run. Now, you know, granted this was 1990 and uh, there were, I would say fewer options for other employment at that time for dancers, for musicians, for, uh, technicians, I think the happily, uh, the world of arts and, and culture and, and live entertainment has grown significantly, even if it's to provide content for you know shows like these or others. But at any rate, people knew that their futures were uh, were going to be affected by their decisions on this uh, on this day. And so happily, each group came back independently and said that they would agree to do the the 10 day run. And we were successful in raising actually more than the target amount in that 10 day period, and then continued to raise enough to keep the uh, the company going. And frankly, the company is still uh, in business today. That's amazing. And how long, what, what did you do to inspire them other than just sort of give the ultimatum and say, look, your choices, do it, or, you know, hit the streets with a you know, a brown paper bag and, or a, a hat in hand kind of a thing and beg for your next meal. What, how did you get them on board? Well, I think our, uh, our own authenticity and our uh, sort of freshness and, and new introduction into the situation helped. We didn't create the situation. We were only there about three months when, you know, this, this was sort of presented to us. And so there didn't, need to be a a, a a reckoning of responsibility. And so mm -hmm. when I stood in front of this group, they knew that I was coming from a similar position. I had just relocated to Philadelphia and and uprooted myself and signed a lease. And you know, now I'm going to be looking for a job. So I think that authenticity and that shared experience of surprise and uh, and lack of blame, anywhere. We were objective. Uh, we said, look, this is how it is. Doesn't matter how we got here. Doesn't matter what decisions could have been done differently. Uh, there's no going back and dissecting the path here. We're just here. And what do we do together to move forward and, and create a better future? It seems like the fact that there was something of an, we're all in this together mentality, the, the certainly having no blame to share or shift or whatever else is uh, removes some of the uh, inherent friction, but the fact that you'd lose your job too, they'd lose it. And you would be working for free. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get paid either. It's not like, so I need all of you to not get paid for 10 days. I'm of course going to clear my paycheck of, but that's, you know, I'll just have a bonus instead. And I, but while you guys don't get paid, so it was where I'm going to do this, 12 hours a day for the next 10 days without getting paid too. 
but in so we're all in it together. We will all we will all sacrifice together. We will all contribute together. And it's also because we have a similar shared vision of the desired outcome, which is save the ballet so we can all come back, do what we love to do, which is why we're all here and get paid for it in the process. So am I speculating too much on this or does that? No, that's a very good summary, Laura. And yes, it, it, we were all in it together. And I think that's what inspired the community as well. Uh, there was a great outpouring, a huge amount of uh, community support and foundation support, corporate support, and it's what made the the campaign successful. That's amazing to get uh, not just all the performers, but union, three different unions. You got to all agree to come in and collaborate together. That's That's got to be on a plaque somewhere on the wall or some sort of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Did I just date myself? I think I did. So it's some sort of Believe It or Not factor. And with that, of course, you're in these new roles and bringing in other new people. But what's a time when you interviewed candidates for a leadership role in one of your organizations and you thought to yourself, wow, this person really has it. What was that it factor and how did you recognize it? Wow. Well, I think what it is to me is certainly a command of the subject. I'm impressed when people are good at what they do. And I I need as many strong people around me as I can afford and as I can find. So I've always tried to hire for the deepest strengths I could find. I don't I don't ever think that's intimidating or that anybody's overqualified for a role. So I think it's it when it's clear to me that they have a great command of that subject matter, whatever uh, they're being hired to do. They come across with great confidence, uh, but a certain amount of humility with that as well, because you know they 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 need to work with a team. Uh, I I don't like to see anybody sort of put their uh, expertise out as greater than anyone else's, even if they do happen to be the expert uh, in that area. Um, and I think the the thing that pushes me over the the top and would make me uh, say definitely, wow, this is a, a star, is a dose of humor. We've got to have a little fun with it. We spend a lot of time together in work, and I like to think it's at least a little bit fun. I think that's important. And there's, it's not necessarily trying to be funny. It's not trying to pretend that you're moonlighting as a stand up comic, although in New York or Philadelphia, there's probably a decent chance that somebody might be. But nevertheless, that you can take your content seriously, but not take yourself too seriously, develop a little bit of rapport with the person. You know, you mentioned an important balance. And I think a lot of people will get caught up on the, uh, the possibility of seeing them as as incompatible, the need for a balance of confidence and humility. What would you say to somebody who says, well, aren't they kind of the opposite? How can you have both? I think you can have both. I think that no matter how much of an expert you are, there are more things that you can learn, even if it's contrary to what you you think the the general knowledge or the general wisdom is. So for example, there's a fresh take on everything that you are already doing. It could be from someone who's not even an expert. And I go back to my own experience in leading teams of arts organizations and dancers and choreographers and singers and the like. And you'd be surprised. They might sort of hear your take on a financial concept or or direction and say, oh, well, you know, that's sort of like fill in the blank. And I think that everyone can bring a fresh perspective and you need to be humble enough that you're open to, to listening to that. And I've learned a lot from other people's input who maybe aren't even trained in that. Sure, sure. And I think there's also a lot of people who may um, erroneously conflate humility with false modesty, right? That humility Okay, you're not going to say, hey, I'm the best at this and nobody knows more than I do. That, of course, that's that know it all arrogance, far extreme on the gray scale of confidence. But on the other side, why should you say, no, I'm not very good at that? Or no, I don't really know. I don't, I don't like to talk about myself, or I'm just going to downplaying what you darn well know is a strength, which is why you're interviewing for this position in the first place. So to 
you, you don't have to pretend that you're not good at or confident with or enjoying those things that are your natural strengths in, in under the guise of being humble. That that false modesty, I think, will undermine the confidence, if anything, and, and certainly the fun part. I, I don't think those would go very well together either. But uh, am I drawing a line of distinction that that resonates with you as well? Yes, absolutely. And I would just follow up by saying it's frequently a, a female trait to to downplay what they're good at and and come up with maybe an overly modest representation of their strengths. And I try to encourage people to have the right assessment of their strengths, be confident, be um, secure in in everything that you know you can do. And yes, it involves going out on a limb and, and making a commitment and saying, yes, I'm going to do this job for you and I'm going to do it really, really well. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do it better than anybody you're going to talk to on these interviews. So hire me and you need to have that, but then play on a team and, and work together. Absolutely. Now, finally, then what's something fun? that you do to create a, or something that you do to create a little bit more fun, I should say, for your team or organization? Well, I certainly like when they inject humor in any situation of, you know, meetings or uh, even presentations. We're not doctors. It doesn't have to be terribly over serious. Uh, if we are, uh, get down a, a path and, and digress from the topic at hand, it's uh, it, it's not the end of the world. So talk about their their personal lives. I like to try to remember uh, details and and uh, stories about their own lives and where they were over the weekend or what vacation is coming up. And I just I just think that personal touch, particularly having been separated for so long over COVID, uh, the small chit chat on Zoom never felt the same. And I, I like to try to just make the the meetings that we have, the interactions that we have as, as personal and as fun as possible. That sounds great. And I think people need to remember that humanizing the meeting, even just starting out, like we started with a fun fact, just a little something to reconnect the people and not just be human spreadsheets, exchanging data uh, of sorts, makes a little can go a long way, can it? Indeed. All right. Well, Ellen, this has been a great conversation. How can people learn more about you and Wilkes University? Well, certainly by visiting the website, wilkes.edu. And I would encourage our audience to also follow Wilkes on Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, all the usual spaces. Uh, it is a, a, a lovely campus in a, a beautiful small town. I am prejudiced. I grew up here, <laughs> uh, but it is, uh, it, it's a perfect mix of enough urban uh, action and and activities and fun, uh, but then a small town sort of bucolic campus that's just beautiful to experience. And for people who want to get in touch with you or learn more about you. I can be followed on LinkedIn as well. That's where I primarily uh, do all of my postings. So please reach out to me, Ellen Gallagher. That sounds great. And of course, in the show notes today, we will have all of those links and, and whatnot. So we do encourage everybody out there to please follow Ellen. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. And thank you everybody out there for listening. As always, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts so we can have, help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, of course, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations for virtual influence, including my picks for microphones, lights, and more, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. 
The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.